Now, as you see, the theme is persecution and how faith helps us to overcome it. Abu Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, in one of his wonderful essays, spoke of the human spirit. And he said, when the human spirit really comes alive is when it encounters the spirit of faith. And the spirit of faith, as you know, is generated by the manifestations of God. Uh, Moses, Muhammad, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, they created a spirit of faith in their followers. And it is that spirit of faith that transforms the individual and makes it possible for him to rise above his human limitations. Now, in the early days of the Baha'i faith, which began, by the way, in 1844, in the middle of the 19th century, the Bab, who was the first manifestation of the Baha'i faith, there's two of them, the Bab and Baha'u'llah, uh, he declared that he was the promised gate leading to the Qa'im, which was the return of the 12th Imam, which Islam, Shiite Islam, had been waiting for for a thousand years. So this caught fire. It was like a rocket across the horizon of Persia. Today it's Iran, then it was called Persia. And tens of thousands of Muslims became instant followers of the Bab. They were then known as Babis. And they believed that he had come to finally renew Islam and raise it to the heights and transform the whole world. Well, the established church, as has happened with every religion in history, took fright, was worried that people would leave them, and they began the most rigorous persecution uh, practically in modern history. Something like 20,000 Babis were slaughtered with the most fearful tortures and the most terrible uh, means. Now the excuse they used, because the Baha'i faith teaches love, unity, friendship among all peoples, so the excuse they used was that in the Quran, Muhammad said he was the seal of the prophets and anyone who came after him had to be a heretic, had to be worthy of death because he was disturbing the, the natural order. So the persecutions became so bad, the Bob himself was executed with a firing squad of 750 rifles. The Babis themselves were told that if they would just recant their faith, they would be showered with honors and given an ideal place in society. But very, very few of them would do that because the spirit of faith had entered their hearts to such an extent that they willingly gave their lives as an expression of their faith in Baha'u'llah and in the Bab. Now, this kind of martyrdom is very different than the martyrdom we hear of today. You know, they weren't blowing themselves up or causing people harm. They were simply refusing to recant their faith. And for this, the government got to the point where they would for example, in Tehran, each uh, guild, like the, uh, say, the uh, Silversmith Guild or the um, uh, Blacksmith Guild, would be given a certain number of bah Babi prisoners and told, devise the most fiendish tortures you can to kill these Babis. These are, you know, they will destroy Islam if you do not destroy them. And so this was a, an early example of the persecutions that took place in our faith and the spirit that drove them to keep clinging to the love of God, to the love of Baha'u'llah, the love of the Bab uh, at that time. Now, unfortunately, these persecutions continue right down to the present day. Seven leading Baha'is are already in prison in Iran. Uh, other Baha'is are expelled from university or schools they're not allowed to have jobs. Uh, the government seized all their savings. All of these were persecutions solely on the basis of being Baha'is. But what sustained them, again, was that spirit of faith. Now, in 1921, uh, with the death of Abdu'l-Baha, 
what was called the heroic age of the faith ended. Uh, no longer did Baha'is have to give their life to prove their faith. Beginning in 1921, the guardian of the faith began a process of teaching the Baha'is how to organize into communities and to set up their administrative order. As you may know, we have no clergy. Uh, there's no ecclesiastical hierarchy permitted in the Baha'i faith, but Baha'u'llah himself set down the standards for an administrative order, which was elected by the Baha'is themselves. And there are no professional Baha'is. Everybody serves voluntarily. So this process began with the guardian. And then martyrdom became not giving your life for the faith, but going out and teaching other people the faith. Now, we're not allowed to proselytize. We can only answer people's questions and hold meetings and encourage people to come and learn about our faith. So we can't go out you know, and pigeonhole them and force them uh, to understand this. So I was particularly struck by the example of one man. His name is Angus Cowan. He became a friend. Now, as uh, Paul mentioned, I became a Baha'i in 1948. And I think it was the next year I might have met Angus casually while I was in Toronto. And later on, when I was about 23, I was 19 when I declared, I uh, moved to Winnipeg. And I'd kind of drifted away from the faith. And as I was walking down, uh, I guess, Portage Avenue, I encountered Angus. And he remembered me from back then. And he urged me to come to his Baha'i fireside. That's how we taught the faith in those days. We'd invite people to our home and uh, give presentations. So I was a little reluctant. I thought it was kind of pushy. But I went anyway. And I was very glad I did, because he really saved my life. I then became very devoted to the faith and started going to regular firesides. That's where I met my first wife. In fact, our marriage was a feature of his Friday night fireside. Now, uh, Angus was one of those rare individuals. Uh, you know, most of us, if we join a faith or a movement of any kind, we always do so with a few reservations. You know, maybe we like this and that, but maybe we'll leave that aside. Or maybe uh, we still like to do something we're not supposed to do, right? Angus became a Baha'i and instantly, totally became a Baha'i to the depths of his being. He obeyed every law, he prayed steadily, and he devoted his life to serving the faith by teaching it. Now, he formerly worked for IBM. Uh, he was one of their top salesmen. And he bought a house in Winnipeg, which was very unusual. From the outside, it looked like an ordinary home. But you walk in, and the living room is 40 feet long and two stories high. And this giant living room is what he used for his firesides. And he always had you know, 10 to 20 young people there, boys and girls, men and women. And uh, every passing teacher who came through Winnipeg, he would drag off to his firesides. So that's how I spent seven wonderful years in frozen Winnipeg, learning about the faith <laughs> and learning about teaching the faith. Angus uh, eventually decided that he had to bring the faith to the native people. So he sold his house in Winnipeg at a huge loss. I mean, who wants a 40-foot, two-high, two-story high living room? But he moved to Regina so he could be near the native people. He particularly wanted to take the faith to the aboriginal inhabitants of Canada. And I went out there, I remember, 1959 with him uh, to the Poor Man Reserve, to the Pasqua Reserve, uh, where we met the first two Baha'is uh, first two native Baha'is in Canada, really, uh, Tommy Anaquad and his mother. And he labored ceaselessly, going to reserve after reserve, spreading the teachings of Baha'u'llah and attracting the native people. At one time, I think about the mid-80s, over half the Baha'is in Canada were First Nations. So effective was the teaching work that was being done at that time. Eventually, Angus decided to move from Regina. And uh, he came to Invermere in BC. 
And of course, he had to sell the house in Regina, and he had a little problem there. Every time the real estate agent would bring people to look at it, because Angus had been so involved with First Nations people, he was also very hospitable, and the house was, there were natives living everywhere in the house, in the corridors and the halls, uh, you know, crashing there while they were visiting Win uh, Regina. So the agent said, please, could you get rid of these? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm never going to sell your house because they think all these Indians come with it. <laughs> but he eventually did sell it and moved to Inuvik. And because of his dedication and his work for the faith, uh, he was finally asked to take the highest rank that a Baha'i can have, and that is to be uh, a member of the Continental Board of Counselors. This is a tremendously important station and a very, very demanding one. And mind you, through all this period, he was always struggling for just to make a living. He was always had health problems, but none of that slowed him down for a minute. Now another one, somebody's going to come up in a minute, I know. Uh, another one uh, was Dorothy Francis. She was a native woman uh, from Winnipeg. She was born on a reserve about uh, 150 miles north of Winnipeg. And for her first seven years, she was raised by a grandmother where she absorbed native culture and native spirituality. And she became a Baha'i when she was 48 in 1960. And during the time before that, she'd worked very hard uh, at organizing homemakers clubs and doing what she could to promote native culture. Now, as you may know, Baha'is uh, believe that cultural identity is very important. So we encourage the support of native culture in Canada everywhere. Uh, in fact, um, we make a point, for example, my friend Lee Brown does a wonderful talk about the peacemaker, the Ganawida, who was the prophet who came to the um, Iroquois people. And uh, we believe that he was just as much a spiritual leader as any throughout history. So we acknowledge the spiritual teachers of all the peoples. So this is very attractive to the native people because they're not being put down for their own spirituality. And uh, Dorothy, eventually, because she worked so hard in organizing native friendship centers, uh, creating native dance groups, uh, native craft groups, Remember, all this was disappearing back in the 60s and 70s, and Dorothy was one of the real pioneers who did so much towards that. And for that, she eventually received the Order of Canada. On April the 19th, 1978, uh, the Governor General pinned the Order of Canada on her. That same day, she was in Vancouver. She went to Granville Street to a jewelry store and went in to try and buy a little piece that she wanted and they refused to serve her because she was a native woman. That uh, made the headlines <laughs> in the Sun newspaper, and I'm sure that jewelry was very embarrassed. Uh, but this was the kind of spirit that was animating people like Angus and Dorothy. Now the final bit, the Guardian by 1937 had reached the point where he could, he'd educated the Baha'is, we were forming assemblies, we were forming groups, uh, we were getting ready to teach. And he set up the first seven-year plan. Now, there's only about a 1,000 North American Baha'is in the United States and Canada. And he called upon us to go and pioneer to every single country in Latin America. The war shortly broke out in 1939, so this was the only place we could be sure of going to. And these ordinary middle-class people packed up their families, packed up their, left their jobs, and went to places like Argentina and Chile and Brazil and became a little seed, a little spot, a little Baha'i presence in each one of these countries. None of these countries had any Baha'is at all. By 1957, there were 500 Baha'is in Latin America. In the next 60 years, 
that number doubled 11 times. There's over a million Baha'is now in Latin America, all from this little handful of pioneers who sacrificed their time, their energy, uh, their whole fortune just to go there and do that. Okay, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be back here again and seeing so many familiar faces. It's been a while. And um, I have to tell you, this was hard, this presentation. I've been struggling and in, in, in trying to figure out, well, how do I, what do I cover in 15 minutes, <laughs> right? I mean, this is really something we should be talking about for months at a time. Um, so I decided to actually share with you my journey with adversity and my journey with my faith and how it's influenced me with this relationship with adversity. <laughs> Um, as mentioned, I was about five years old when my parents made the commitment um, to the Sikh path. And they committed to the Sikh teachings and the Sikh practices. And they brought those um, teachings and practices back to our family home. And, and so I grew up, I want to say kind of the, the structure of the faith, right? They, they taught us. and. And there's a lot I learned by osmosis. There was a lot I learned by observation. I realized that there's a lot of people um, who, while we agreed on the teachings, how we put them into practice actually really did differ from one adult to another. And I could see those differences in expressions as a child. But this was a very passive uh, part of my life. This was really my parents' deal. It wasn't mine. Right? This was their gig, and um, it wasn't until 21 when I fell in love. And it was an awakening, <clears throat> uh, which is its own story. It, it, happened at, it happened at Woodward Library at UBC. <laughs> it was those big, stuffy, you know, red chairs, if anybody remembers them. Um, and, but there was this awakening. It was like this light bulb had, like the switch had been turned on, and, and all of a sudden, um, the world was very different. And um, I had access to so much more than I had had before when I was asleep. <clears throat> and part of what I had access to now was teachings and practices and tools with how to deal with adversity, right? See, adversity and I, we had a very adversarial relationship, OK? There were times when I won, and there was time when adversity won, okay? And when adversity won, or was winning, it was very painful. It was really, really hard. And, um, and my practice at that time, you know, as I'm new in this relationship um, with the divine and with my teachings, and was um, I would wait till it got to agony, and then I would ask for help from the divine. Okay. And um, I, did, I was a slow learner. I did this several times. Okay. I, it was, wow. And I look back going, really? It took that long for me to get the picture, hey? But that's what I would do. I would, <clears throat> you know, a challenge would come, right? Whatever it would happen to be, whether it was personal or work-related or, or discrimination, whatever it happened to be. And I would, I would you know... <clears throat> rise up to that challenge and put hard work towards it and energy and I would counsel with people and I would get advice. And like I said, sometimes I won. That methodology worked. And then sometimes I didn't and I was losing and I was in agony. And when I reached that point was when I would be like, please help me. <laughs> right? And it really, <clears throat> I remember one dark time. It was, I, it was like I was in this pit of darkness. There was no hope at this point. I was so overwhelmed. I was, I, and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't see my way out of this. And I remember, you know, trying to, to talk to my family, my parents about it, and we got into an argument, and, and <clears throat> I remember screaming my hopelessness and my fear and, and, and my rage. And my mother heard that, you know? She, she clued in that there was something more going on than me just being an angsty, you know, young adult. 
And I remember that night going to bed and I'm curled up in the fetal position and I'm crying. Like I stormed out of the room crying, went to my room, I'm still crying. And all I could rem I remember is I was just sitting there just begging and saying, please help me, please help me. I can't go on like this anymore. This isn't life. I, there's no hope, there's nothing, it's just so dark. And I, I remember just begging. I just begged and I begged and I fell asleep begging. And the next morning I woke up and I went to work and I you know, went through the motions. Put one foot in the front of the other and came home that night. And my dad was waiting for me and he says, listen, I wanna to talk to you. And I said, okay, and I'm thinking, oh boy, you know, last night wasn't so good. <laughs> and um, we sat down and he said, you know, I know you're struggling with this. What if we did this? And he put an idea on the table. And it was like this ray of sunshine, right? This hope that just flooded me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. That would totally work. And I was in, right? There was hope again and everything had shifted. And I was so grateful because I would catch the pattern, right? I would catch the, I'd be in agony, I would scream for help, and I'd beg for it, and I would get it. And it would show up, sometimes very quickly. And sometimes it took a little while. And the right person or the right set of circumstances came into my life. And I was always very grateful. I would be so grateful saying, thank you. Thank you so much for helping me. And then I'd go back to business. <laughs> back to my regular, right? Do, 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 do. Nothing changed. And so I did this several times. And eventually, there just came this moment, kind of like there's these light bulb moments in life, right? And I had this light bulb moment and I thought, you know, every time I've asked for help, you know what I do, Jean? You gave it to me. You never let me down. People have, right? People didn't keep their promises, or I've asked for help and been denied, or someone said they would do it and at the last minute changed their mind. So people I know had let me down, but you've never, you've never done that. And I, it was like I could feel inside of me this trust, right? Because that's how trust is built. It's when we're not let down. We take the risk and we reach out. And when that person doesn't let us down, we start to trust, and that trust started to grow. And, and then, you know, I'm kind of going along, and another light bulb moment happens, and it's like, you know, and it was, it was really me kind of talking to, like, going, wow, okay, I think I'm a pretty big idiot here. Uh, why am I waiting till I'm in agony to ask for help? Like, why am I not asking right at the beginning of the challenge? Right? I mean, here's this being that's never let me down, has always helped me out. So why am I not just asking right at the beginning? And it was like this da moment. It was like, yeah, yeah, that's a, okay, that makes sense. And I shifted, right? And I shifted and I thought, okay, so I'm having daily conversations. I mean, this period of my life was very hard. There was, you know, some very steep challenges at that time. And so I had daily conversations with the divine, right? What's the next step? How do we do this? What about this? Okay, I'm open to guidance. I'm open, you know, to receive. And it still wasn't working <laughs> perfectly. It, uh, I realized that while my heart was open and I was engaged, in <clears throat> the pressure of the challenge, right, and, and trying to overcome this, I had dropped my spiritual practice in my daily life, okay? In some way, the very tool that would have sustained me, but I was in my 20s and, you know, I, there was a lot of energy <laughs> in my 20s and it felt like there was this unending well, right, um, until it ran dry. Because I wasn't, I, it, there was nothing in my consciousness to me, for me to realize that I needed to actually keep filling that well if I wanted to be sustainable. So 
I realized I needed to have a spiritual practice to sustain me, to deal with the stresses on my body, um, and also to refill that well that had really gone empty, that, that natural energy that I was born with, it, I'd used it all up. So the journey began with the spiritual practice, and, and it was, um, my, my goal was, um, I wanted to, uh, my objective, I guess I can say, was, was I wanted to deepen my relationship with the divine, right? Whatever it was. And I knew that I, I needed to be sustainable because really at that point, 35, I mean, I was like, I don't even know how I'm going to make it to there, <laughs> right? This, this way of life is just not sustainable, so something's got to give. This is not working. And um, I, uh, I, ex I was willing to explore because I had this trust and I knew, I knew the Divine Beloved that, you know, as long as my objective was um, to deepen my relationship with the Beloved, then I was open to try anything, right? As long as it matched the teachings of my faith and it didn't violate. There was no fear. My Beloved wasn't going to say to me, uh, 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 that's not acceptable or we don't do that. You know, there was nothing like that. And so I, it was a time of really, it still is. I'm, I'm still on that journey. And it, it just opened up inside of me to realize that every person was a manifestation of the divine, right? Every being had a message to give me, either to tell me what not to do, or to tell me, to show me really what not to do, or to show me what to do, 